Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Harvey B. Gantt Center to celebrate the opening of Patrick Alston's first solo museum exhibition in the United States. I want to just give you a round of applause before we even get started on anything. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dexter Wimberly. I'm an independent curator, and I've been working closely with the Gantt Center for many, many years now, and uh, we started this open air series about three years ago. I don't know if some of you uh, remember that. There was something called the pandemic, and uh, a lot of things happened <laughs> during that time. Um, but one of the good things that uh, emerged from that was the opportunity to do online programming that would open up these discussions to the world as opposed to being uh, limited to people in a room. But that said, I'm excited to be back in a room, and uh, after almost, um, wow, um, I don't know, like 40 open airs that were online. This is one of the rare opportunities to do this in person. So thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm gonna start off with just the, you know, the, the, the thing you must do, which is like read the bio, so you gotta sit through your own bio. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Patrick Alston energetically creates works that along with the interplay of titles trigger thought-provoking and reflective topics, including but not limited to sociopolitics, identity, language, and the psychology of color. His recontextualized subjects, rich palettes, and complex compositions are dramatized, exhilarating energies expressed through gestural mark, making that helped to project an unwritten aesthetic that makes up the urban landscape. Whoever wrote this bio really wanted to challenge me. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Austin's work creates harmonious tension and challenges viewers to look carefully at the world around them, discovering beauty in unconventional places. So um, I think everyone here has had an opportunity, well, hopefully, to go to the gallery to see your exhibition as it's right across uh, the way from here. But um, although I've read your bio, I'd just love to give you a moment to introduce yourself the way you normally would if I hadn't oh. just read that bio. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you so much uh, for coming out, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience as well. Um, like he said, my name is Patrick Alston. Uh, I'm a visual artist born and raised in uh, the Bronx, New York. I currently live in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, where um, I have a studio as well. And um, yeah, that's sort of a brief background of my history. Um, as you can see, I'm a visual artist, a painter, but I've sort of began delving into uh, some sculptural elements. You'll see some from my past shows that um, are more immersive, um, contribute to the paintings as well. Um, so that's what, that's, I guess, who I am. There's a lot more to me, but. Well, we're gonna get into a lot more. Yeah. Um, and again, uh, to echo that, thanks everyone for their patience. So um, this is a really rare occasion, and I'll tell you why. I mean, normally in these circumstances, you, you, you may have the artist present, but you don't have the work, or you have the work present, and you don't have the artist, 
or you just have the slideshow, but you don't have the artist, you have the work, and you have the, you know, you get my point. Today we have everything all at once, and I'm really excited about that. And so uh, without further ado, we're going to get to some of the, uh, you know, the, the visual aids that we have here today. So um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of the concept of the show, right? Yep. And we're going to get into that. But before we get into that, I want to get into sort of like, your inspirations and your back, you know, so like the backstory on your, your processes as an artist. So Absolutely. Let's, let's start on that. Yeah, so I guess we can start as to um, how a guy born in New York and the Bronx gets into the visual art world um, and this version of painting that is sort of reminiscent of the Abex um, New York school. So um, we chose these images in order to sort of give you a layout of who those Abex painters are. There's the obvious uh, Rothko's, the Jackson Pollock's, but um, they are sort of my initial, um, you would say, uh, picture into uh, delving into uh, abstraction. These guys were huge inspirations for me to um, start that process. That happened somewhat uh, early in college, so 2000, uh, between 2010, 2011. Um, I used to be a figurative painter, started out that way, uh, but came across uh, this cohort of, of, of guys. And, um, you know, when I first came across abstract expressionism, there was a challenge to understand the language that they were trying to convey. And one of the ways that I began to understand that language is, as you see below, one of my favorite pictures that I am not sure is on the internet, but I got from uh, this guy's son, um, this is Philip Gustin, one of my huge inspirations, next to Stanley Whitney, and he's one of his uh, he's one of his teachers. And I sort of look at myself as coming from a lineage of of painters. Um, so ideally, I would sort of be next to Stanley Whitney <laughs> in that picture. But um, that's that's um, I guess a brief background as to what my background is in Abex, um, and then. We sort of threw in the Miles Davis portion as well um, in order to also break down, I guess, an introduction into creativity for me. So in high school, I picked up a trumpet for the first time, started playing music, and it gave me insight, obviously now, as to what it means to use your intuition when you're creating. Um, and obviously, these guys were also inspired by the jazz of the time and the music of the time. So. Um, I hope that all. No, it does. It yeah. does. And, and thanks for um, you know talking about the the Miles Davis image because I'm sure everyone was like, okay, I, I get the other one, but why yeah, Miles yeah. Davis is there? Um, and uh, let's uh, let's go to the next image because I think this would be helpful to continue that, that yep. dialogue. Absolutely. So this is uh, the Spiral Group. Um, not sure how many people have heard of the Spiral Group, but it was founded by Romare Bearden, um, Norman Lewis, Charles Alston. I would have to, I'll check to see if uh, I have any relations to him, but. Uh, people have asked. People have asked, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I haven't checked yet. But, um, so these guys started something called the Spiral Group, and it was really to found a platform for uh, black artists to, you know, uh, express themselves. And they had galleries all over New York City. I mean, almost all of the huge names have showed with them. And uh, they really inspired me to also craft out, you know, spaces for um, artists in order to have them have a platform. So uh, people like this, um, people who like Sam Gilliam, um, you know, you have Raymond Saunders, all of those guys also influence um, me because what I find is that there's something that's sort of in the ether as to how the universe selects uh, abstractionists. And before I found this cohort of African-American artists who work in abstraction, there were already ideas that I shared with them that I didn't read beforehand. And some of those ideas are sort of um, liberating oneself from expectations of what you should produce. Um, sometimes talking about the denial of the depiction of figuration in a way. And um, I was coming up with the, uh, these ideas and I open up like a Jack Whitten book, you know, Notes from the Woodshed, and he's talking about it, you know, and I'm like, these are my guys, you know. So that's how I came across, um, or I sort of fit into, I think, this lineage of artists who um, are working in that manner. 
You know, what's, what's interesting about what you just said is that I've spent a lot of time in the past couple of years studying abstraction. Um, I, I've always had a love affair with painting and it was sort of like what led me into becoming a curator. Um, and although I've worked with artists who do all sorts of um, things and work in a variety of, of media, painting has always been this thing that is sort of like my, almost like my first love in a way. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to curate an exhibition called Black Abstractionist from, from the, until now um, yes. that had 38 artists in the show. And it was artists that go all the way back to people like uh, Alma Thomas and, uh, you know, all the way up to artists who are, you know, out of grad school for the past three years, like Gabriel Mills, you know. Yep. So it was a really interesting sort of thing. And to look at that lineage of artists and, and people, you know, so I had to like look closely at people like Jack Whitten or Ed Clark. Yep. Um, even David Hammonds and, um, you know, and Frank Bowling and, and other people who are sort of like in this pantheon of abstraction. And so it was really exciting for me to work with you on this show because I feel like you are sort of stepping into that river or stepping into that stream, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of flow of consciousness mm -hmm. and of ideas. And, um, you know, so I just want to just personally um, say that it's been, a, you know, really rewarding to work with you through this process and, and sort of like see an artist that I believe is on a path that's going to lead to, you know, to, some, to somewhere quite interesting and, and, and quite great. Um, the title of this show is Post-Traumatism in Search of Freedom, and I'm quite sure that um, people here are curious about that title. Yep. How did you arrive at that title? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so, well, thank you. But um, so uh, actually... There's supposed to be a family member here uh, at the moment, but she'll walk in at some point, and she doesn't know this, but um, the name uh, post-traumatism came after a conversation with um, a cousin, and um, it was a phone call. She called me, and she wanted my um, input on a poem that she wrote, and she read this beautiful, eloquent poem to me, and at the end, I asked her, I said, um, the poem's great but have you ever created outside of a traumatic place or this, this place of pain? And I asked her what that looks like or if she's ever been able to tap back into her childhood, a place where you know she was sort of free from what the world has you know, imposed upon her. And when I asked that question, she immediately began to cry. And I said, that's it. So I knew that there was truth in what I asked, and obviously tears are somewhat uh, truth. So when I asked that, I began to think about this idea of the role of trauma within our world today, but also within our creative processes. And I began to wonder whether, like, what a world would look like if we were sort of free of trauma. And I, I don't want to be sort of idealistic in a way where I'm not acknowledging the mishaps that happen in the world or accidents or uh, thinking more so things that we have inflict upon ourselves. And I've had the fortunate ability to become a father within the last uh, four years. So I have two sons and um, I began to look around the world and see where I saw people who were in a post-traumatic world, a futuristic world. And I had to look back at my children to sort of see how they navigated the world. And I, I take huge inspiration from my four-year-old who's always in the studio with me. He paints and the, sh the, the painting that you'll see in the show titled Play is a play off of um, me watching him and watching, observing the way that he uh, creates in the world. And I just, there's a, there's a brilliantness to um, watching, I think, children in a way. And if I can just get into this point really quickly, it's, um, I'm going to take you back to the ABEX movement. But the interesting thing about the ABEX movement is the point in time that this came about. And it came about right after World War II, where there was a huge traumatic world event, right? And the thing about that is when I, when I began to sit back and think about it, I say, why, you know, why is this movement so, so rich, so important? Like, why do we gravitate toward this work that's non-narrative? And I came up with this idea that when the world is in a place of pain, we don't necessarily look at the humanity when, in one another. So I, sometimes I think that figuration can't um, serve as a middle ground or a connecting point between us. 
So what do we have to look toward? We have to look toward uh, more simple things. Um, uh, the way it, the way that um, a child might sort of draw, the innocence of a child's drawing is something that we could sort of look at and connect us. Um, color, um, uh, color across cultures. There are these things that I think um, can intertwine or serve as a, a foundation for us to begin conversation again. So I think that we sort of swing uh, in a, on a pendulum of, uh, in my belief, an interest in figuration, an interest in abstraction, and I think it would be interesting to look at how that correlates to world events and what's going on and when these, um, you know, what people sort of gravitate toward in those moments. But uh, that's, there's a little bit more to it, but that's a brief background as I, uh, how I came up with the, the term post-traumatism. It's a sort of futurist look into, the, into where I think, or w where I would like to see the world. Um, and I think that you can probably encompass all of humanity's history as a marching toward or a running toward a post-traumatic future. We're trying to get there, and in many ways the paintings that are in the show are the sort of battlegrounds that um, are happening in future, oh, in current events and past events, trying to lead toward this future, this future that I'm referring to. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, so now let's let's get into some of the works that are in the show yep. and talk a little bit about them with some specificity and also like referencing more of your sort of foundational inspirations. Yeah, absolutely. So this this painting um, is the first painting when you walk in. It's titled "Everywhere Is War." And um, the title came about, I, I was listening to um, Bob Marley's uh, War, and there's a you know, portion of it. Um, but at the same time, I was also thinking about Pica Picasso's Guernica and its inspiration on me. And the, I mean, it's a, if you've ever seen the work in person, it's, a, it's such a profound painting. It's, it's huge, and it's sort of throwing in our faces uh, the brutal realities of you know, uh, that were going on during that time. Uh, one piece of this puzzle in his work that really impacted me, speaking of uh, the children here, is on the left side, there's a woman, but if you look closely, her tongue is almost in a triangle position. And it sort of displays a she like the, sh the, sh the streak of, you know, this mother who just lost her child. And um, so my, I'm, when I was thinking about my own painting, uh, this painting started out completely different. It was a pinkish turquoise painting, very lively, very vibrant. And um, there were a few events that, but this, this probably, this was created maybe January-ish. I was, um, and I just, I became frustrated with what I was seeing, um, just minor things. And I was listening to Bob Marley's song and just started throwing paint at the canvas and worked out this composition, and I just picked up on that, that cue in his song, Everywhere's War, and titled it. So you can see how sort of uh, a work that's non-narrative non in a way, or non, um, I guess you would say, uh, figuration, would sort of try to display via color, via um, gesture, um, and mood, um, a, I guess you would say, motion. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. So you, you, you use the term throwing paint, and I want to use that as a, as, a, as a jumping off point to talk about the actual process of making the work. Yep. Um, for, you know, for people who have never visited an artist studio, and that's most people, right, um, and people who haven't actually painted, which is also like most people, yep. um, the process that is involved in, in making a painting, yep. especially a large painting, um, is very, very uh, physical, mm -hmm. um, can sometimes be exhausting, um, I, I imagine. Um, it's also quite expensive, too, yeah. um, side note. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what, what goes on in your studio? Like yeah. what, what is that like? What, how do you approach the, the logistics yeah. of making one of these paintings? Um, yeah, so the, I guess um, I can start with, I try to get into a meditative state. And the way I do that, um, nothing too special, but I begin cleaning the studio from my last session. And that taps me into just a, a momentum that I, where I can get going. 
um, on a painting. And uh, the way that these start is these are made from a, like almost a pleather material um, that is not like a cotton duck canvas, so it sort of rejects paint, and so uh, paint sits on the tops of these surfaces. And um, I begin by working on the floor. Most of these, because of the nature of the rolls that I purchase, um, you'll see a line that sort of is right in between the paintings here. And that's because there's a sewn element in the work, so I'm sewing it in order to uh, have a large enough surface to paint on. Um, but they start out on the floor, and I begin playing with uh, watered down color, uh, so paint you know, diluted down with water or an acrylic medium. Um, I start out with acrylics and um, splash water around and there's a element of surprise there. When the paint dries, you don't really know what you're gonna see. And then there's a call and response that goes on in the works after that. Um, I try to lay down a few gestures, but I really, at some point, have to get that um, fabric stretched. And then um, I'll place these paintings up on the wall and I work on a bunch at the same time. So I'll jump back and forth between uh, paintings. If I mix a color and it doesn't look good on the one I'm painting, I'll just jump over to another painting and start laying down color. And um, you know, many people always ask, how do you know a painting is done? You know, how do you know it's complete? And I'm not sure that you ever really know that a painting is complete, but it's almost like, it's almost like having a conversation with someone, right? How do you know it's done? It's just sometimes when you don't have anything else to say. When they leave the room, it's, it's yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you don't have anything else to say. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about that portion is um, I'm an overthinker sometimes, right? So I'll have a conversation with someone and I'll start thinking about the conversation after we had the conversation. And you, you just have to accept that the paintings will have a conversation with people on their own and they'll sort of interact with people. And to be honest, you guys are the reason these paintings even sort of have a meaning in a way because there's a conversation going on between us. And um, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, well th thanks. And we're, we're gonna talk about what's on the, what's on the, on the screen yeah. now, but I also wanna talk a little bit about, more about your process, and yeah. this is, we'll get into that, but also the ritual. I, I like the idea that you, you, know, you describe that sort of like ritual of like cleaning the studio bef from your last session before you go to um, start on your new session, yep. which leads me to believe that you probably end your last session when you no longer have the energy to continue going, right? Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> I just drop the paintbrushes, hopefully they don't dry overnight, and I walk out. <laughs> and many times, you know, you, you just, there's a lot of frustration that goes on with painting. James there's, Brown used to just walk off the stage. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of frustration that goes on in the process of painting. and. Uh, not every painting works. There's so many paintings that people don't see that um, uh, we artists bear the burden of uh, trying to um, f figure out those compositions. And uh, yeah, I think the process of um, having that ritual, cleaning, putting on music, maybe lighting a scent in the studio, it gets you into a creative mode. Sure, that I try sure, to tap into. absolutely. Yep. So let's let's talk about. Um, so so one of the things I asked Patrick for the this discussion was to sort of provide some images that would give the audience some clues as to what you're thinking about um, when, you're, when you're making your work. Yeah. yeah, so there's a few, we'll talk about a few things here, um, but one thing, if anyone's followed my practice, you'll notice is these are the first landscape paintings that I've made in a while. A lot of the other works were actually uh, square in nature. So um, I began thinking about actually my introduction in art um, and the first visuals that I actually saw within, I guess, understanding uh, art would be murals that were in New York City um, and graffiti that was in New York City. And so I was interested in a few things there, right? The, um, s a lot of the murals where we grew up um, sort of depicted the fallen soldiers of that area, which was sort of the, this traumatic thing that I was around. And, um, you know, they were always landscape based. And I didn't realize it at the time, but those things were sort of influencing um, my practice as well. But also, the, the, you know, the, the, the diverse nature of color, this idea of, you know, an artist using whatever name they created and continuously tagging their name around in order to demand attention to uh, make their mark present. 
um, in this current time. So that's sort of where I was going with that. But it's also, when you walk into the show, it's very colorful, right? Uh, growing up in New York, the vibrancy that was there, whether it was fashion or just anything about the energy of New York, I think, I'm not even sure if I'm consciously trying to do that at this point. It's just in me, you know, it's just sort of what my upbringing was. So um, that's, you know, that's a historic place. Five Points, unfortunately, uh, was painted over. But um, I think that there are these, you know, elements that you'll find in the city, uh, that you'll find in the work, not one-to-one, -one, but um, some of the, uh, the, the thinking behind these artists. Have you ever done graffiti yourself? No, no. I, like, I, I don't think that you should also look at the works as graffiti. I more so appreciate the repetition of mark making there. It's uh, this idea of... You know, there's a statute of limitations, so if you did yeah. it, you could just say it, you know. <laughs> Keep that. <laughs> Let's cut that part out. <laughs> um, <no. laughs> Sorry. Um. Yep. Uh, yeah, so this, this one, um, there's a few things in this image. The, the last one was actually taken like two days ago in, in Costa Rica. Uh, so I'm, I'm consi if you look through my phone and my images, I'm consistently like taking pictures of these moments that are happening. So that, that green space that's sort of right in the middle, that's um, in New York, the, the, the pillars and beams that hold up New York City subway stations. Uh, those are layers and layers of paint that stations sort of go through. And the thing is, you know, no one, no one knew, I guess, wh whatever hit that thing, the layers would reveal themselves. And there's a beautiful element of like this happening without someone actually doing it or like um, the, the visual, the, 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 the color components in the way that they interact, I pick up on that. And it's these, these natural, I'm gonna call them natural, but natural iterations of our environment that I sort of, I gravitate toward and I, I love, right? So when you look at the work, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one thing, but it's the color interactions that are there that I, um, I love to find. I just, I take photos of them. I'll flip through my phone when I'm in the studio and just sort of see if I, if I find a um, relationship that I want to try to make a painting um, sort of out of. And and what is the image on the bottom? That was a uh, that was um, a coffee shop that was in Costa Rica, where um, you know you it's a very beautiful country, but um, that's just from people walking on the stairs, and they paint it over, and then you know you can see where these footprints are, or what, what, where people actually step. But it's that I mean, look at that green and the yellow and the red. It, you, I I can't I can't paint that. You know, that's not anything that um, someone meant to happen, but it's, it's, it's beautiful to me. You know, it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And um, so we've got uh, two more images um, yep. of, of works that are in the show. And of course, you know, everyone here can actually see the works in person. Mm -hmm. But let's talk a little bit about composition, um, okay. the title of this work, share that. And, uh, and I have a couple of like, sort of like follow-up questions. So, okay. yeah. Yes, the title of this work is uh, We the People. And um, like I said before, I think that, you know, when I'm thinking about the concept of the show as well, um, there are, I don't want there to be a, um, a misunderstanding that we are not in control of our collective destiny in a way. And I, I was thinking about this idea of, you know, who, what We the People actually means. And uh, we actually spoke at dinner. Um, we were talking about, you know, how certain things just don't make sense. The idea that there's only one day, you know, that we um, uh, we can vote in a way. Why is it not two? Um, and I was thinking about the sort of frustration that I was having, um, and thinking about the concept of what it means when it's written, "We the people." Um, but if you wanted to get into, I guess. Um, the direct composition of the painting. Um, yeah, I mean, that on the right-hand side of this painting, that's one of the first gestures that I've sort of made that stands on its own as a very linear mark making with uh, pastel sticks. Um, but I try to play with weight and color and you know that top 
orange gesture uh, demands a lot of attention. So um, I had to sort of leave that bottom element with the canvas itself exposed, but also a little bit of orange just to lay off of that top orange a bit. Um, but yeah, there's, like I said, it's about call and response and just trying to make the composition work. Um, and it's not always explanatory as well. Right. Why it works, it just sometimes does. You know? Right. Yeah. There's a quote on the wall in the gallery, oh. Camus quote, and I'd love to have a moment to hear why you chose to place that quote in the show. Yeah, I feel, I feel like um, that's how I try to live, right? It's become so very free that your existence is an act of rebellion. And um, I think that we have the responsibility to con you know, continuously pursue that. And I think that um, sort of being in a position to um, deny sometimes expectations of you or um, to buck against the system is um, it's such a profound quote. And I think that I'd like to think that I'm living my life like that. Um, but I think that, you know, it's who we are, you know, we the people. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's great. Um, you mentioned a, a book recently, um, a Rick Rubin's book. Yes. Uh, and uh, I actually, because you mentioned it, as I like always like buy new books and audio yep. books, so I, I started listening to Rick's, Rick's book. And, and I want to talk a little bit about this creative process because it's, it's a book about creativity. Yes. And how to um, sort of really harness and understand the creative process in, in mm -hmm. sort of like a different way. Mm -hmm. um, why was that book important to you? Uh, it's amazing how eloquently Rick Rubin is able to express ideas that I have. When where you read them, you're like, this guy just gets it. So if you if you're not a creative and um, you have the ability to uh, get the book, I highly recommend it for anyone who wants to understand the creative process or try to tap in it, uh, tap into it themselves or even understand what they're doing as a creative. Um, but he's um, the book is the book is brilliantly written. I, I have it on a table. Yeah. It's in my studio. I randomly, I'll randomly open up the book and just read a quote um, from from there. Yeah, I, the the reason it's also like quite interesting to me. Um, so I, I live in Japan, and the book reminded me of a lot of um, sort of spiritual lessons and mm -hmm. and Buddhist lessons and Shinto lessons as well, like around uh, Shinto lessons around just like understanding your place and in, in the greater universe and you yeah. know and, when, and even when i hear myself saying things like that you know it can sound kind of like you're know, like new new age and hokey and no kind but of like all those but the things. thing is it's true but it's very true right yeah. so it's like um to embrace the randomness yeah right of the, of the world but to not be afraid of it absolutely um, and to understand that that randomness has always existed yeah and will always exist and to try to control it is a pointless thing, and you sort of just have to like be in the flow of yeah. those things. Um, I mean, think about it. Um, like I said again, thank you guys for being here, but if you believe, I guess, in a scientific approach to understanding the universe, we've been around for, what, 13 billion years? And we've all collectively, we're all now collectively in this room after that 13 billion year period right now. So it's also about you know appreciating the now and um, being present and trying to tap into that space. Um, but he he um, is able to uh, also help me think about how I approach my creative practice as well and the way that I think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and even though I don't, um, I, I never consider myself an artist. Um, I, I but I think about things through the lens of an artist. Hmm. Um, I mean, and even in saying that, I mean, I've, I've had like a, a life in music before, a life before becoming an adult. So I guess maybe there's some some of that going, but it's about going through the doors that are open. Yep. Right. Yep. And it's like always been always been my the thing. Like go through the doors that are open. Yeah, you have to you have to follow that. And I think from a painting standpoint, it's there's a moment where if you hesitate to make a mark, you could you could miss out on making a phenomenal painting. So it's about trusting that intuitive approach to painting and sort of not necessarily needing, uh, you know, every painting to work. It's okay if, 
you know, a painting doesn't work, you could start the next one, but you have to trust that intuitive uh, aspect. So, so we have the final work that we'll discuss today and, and actually yep. get to some questions before we wrap up today's conversation. So, mm -hmm. um, so this is the largest work in the show, Liberation March, and it's also in the wonderful gallery guide that was created for the show. So this is going to be like a great souvenir to keep, you know, in 10 years, you'll be like, yeah, I was at Patrick's show. <laughs> um, um, so I want to talk a little bit about this painting because um, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm being completely frank, you know, when I, when I started looking at abstract art many, many years ago, um, I was in incredibly intimidated by trying to, the, the, by the process of trying to read these paintings. Mm -hmm. and, and then I was liberated when I realized that it was going to be my own interpretation. Absolutely. That it wasn't going to be about me trying to see it the way someone else would see it. Yep. And this particular painting, um, I, I wrote about a little bit in, the, in, this, in this gallery guide, but just like thinking about what, what did I feel looking at this work? And in my, I, was, I was immediately struck by the idea that this painting felt like the passage of time. Absolutely. And, 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 in, and in a small way, the passage of a day, right? Like the beginning of the day where, and, and just to kind of put this into context, because of where I live now, it, it's weird because and another artist talked to me about this, and I was like, Ivan, you're so right. The, the light of the sun is very, very different depending upon where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, you would know that if you're in one part of the world forever, and then I think about the light in Brooklyn where mm -hmm. I grew up, the morning light, and how that light had a very specific color to it. And where I live now, the, the morning light has a slightly different hue to it. And it's the mm -hmm. same sun, mm -hmm. and I'm on the same earth, mm -hmm. right? And I look at this painting, and I think about the morning, and then I think about the, like the, the vibrance of the, of the midday, and then that sunset, that burning orange sunset, mm -hmm. and then the cooling off of the night, right? And, and I realize, like, I'm saying that, and I'm seeing that in this painting, and someone else might just see, like, you know, like, it looks like the Ices and the Icy stand where you go and you like scoop the different color Ices. Yep, like yep. everyone has their own read, right? Yep. What were you thinking about? No, I mean, first of all, that was amazing because <laughs> I didn't even, I, I promise you, I didn't see that in my own work. But he, he's like day and night. I, of course, look at it. This is clearly, right? This is clearly like a day, a passage by of um, time. So thank you for that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> in another talk. Um, Copyright 2023. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's my work. <laughs> um, wow, yeah. So there's not a lot of, um, what can I say about this? So the passage of time element, I think, is uh, brilliant here because um, that's exactly it. When I was thinking about the work, uh, I had actually four of these laid out. They, were, they started out as four individual paintings. Started out um, specific, they weren't even gonna be for the show, they were just works that I was creating. But, um, you know, it started on the floor, I stretched the paintings, and when I have a wall that can encompass, like, to a millimeter, right? <laughs> this entirety of this painting. And I put them up, and whatever was going on in the painting, when I, those initial layers, I was like, I have to completely convert this into the largest painting I've done to date. And, um, you know, I began working on it. And the idea of this painting and the idea of passage of time, which is interesting, is, you know, I ended off here, but theoretically I can continue this painting. You know, I, I, could, I could add one over here. I, I think I would leave the left side. I really like how the left side looks, but maybe continue, you know, this is one day, we continue it to the next. Um, you know, but. Passage of time definitely is, is, is there. And you know, I just mentioned before this idea of um, you know, our, our collective march toward the future of a, of a place that I'm talking about. Um, so that's what I was thinking about when I created uh, Liberation March. But thank you for the uh, insight. That's oh, Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you'll get my bill. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, but thank you so much, Patrick. I really, really enjoy hearing you talk about your work. So um, we have some time for questions, and I'd love to uh, encourage um, anyone here that has a question 
um, to ask it. You know, it's rare, it's rare, it's rare. I tell you, you know, um, being in the, in, in the same room as the artist who makes the work, who made the work that's in the gallery that's across the way, it's like, a, it's, a rare, it's a rare and special thing. So take this opportunity to, you know, ask him the toughest question you can come up with. Please. We have a microphone as well for, for you. Thank you. We're under the weather. Um, glad to be here. Um, really appreciate the work. Something in here that you said kind of wanted to ask you to elaborate on when you spoke, speak about a sense of freedom through painting. Mm -hmm. Is that um, searching for freedom or actually being free? That's a great question. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's a continual search, right? And I think that it's a search because even if I feel necessarily free myself, uh, what does it mean? And I want these paintings and this idea to be a collective freedom, right? So like I can enjoy certain individual freedoms, but um, I think that we are all sort of collectively even trying to define still what the word freedom means. You know, there's economic freedom, there's um, political freedom, there's all these different aspects of what freedom means. Um, it, I think it's still being defined in a way. So I think it's, we're still currently in a search for freedom. Thank uh, you for the question. We have time for a couple more. Please be encouraged. Yep. Here we go. Thank you, your stuff is beautiful. I am also a creative, but I am not an abstract. Um, does it always have to have a meaning? No, that, that is a brilliant question because absolutely not. Um, it doesn't have to have a meaning. I think we, I think it's our psychology to sort of look for meaning in things. Uh, but I've heard, I think it was uh, Jack Whitten talk about this before and he spoke about, you know, if you're approaching a mountain, a really beautiful sort of scene, you don't necessarily look at that mountain and ask, what does this mean? You know, you just sort of appreciate it for what it is. And in many ways, I want people to approach my paintings in that way. Um, I don't want there to sort of, I don't want to lecture. I, I, I like the idea of collaboration. Um, I don't want these paintings to sort of beat you over the head with a specific, you know, idea that I'm trying to get across. It's sort of, you're, you're bringing your own experience to the work. Yep. Well, but thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah. Keep, keep making. I think we have time for a couple more. Sure, we have, a qu we have two, so wh where is the one over here? Right here, and we have one more. Okay, great. I'm gonna stand up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna go with um, what um, Mr. Wimberly was saying mm -hmm. and, and kind of give you my interpretation. We went in very early on to take a look at your paintings before everybody got here, and so we had some conversation. And just listening to you and the title about post-traumatism, mm -hmm. And then you talked about the futuristic part of it. And for me, uh, your colors um, are taking the darkness out of, um, of the traumatism and creating light in vibrant colors for us. And then you spoke about the rebellious part of it. And for me, the rebellion is living in the color mm -hmm. that you've created for us and, and freeing ourselves from the darkness of the trauma. That's what I see. Do you write at all? She has to write. You know she writes. Right. She must write. Are you a writer? Are you a writer? No, I'm not a writer. That I'm was, actually that was, that was beautiful. a professor of nursing. Wow. I teach nursing students. Okay. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a, uh, thank, thank you. you no, that. thank you so much. Thank you. But there was a question on this side, yeah? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, so my question is, what were some of the initial struggles you faced as an abstract artist? I know you mentioned you started with figurative painting before. Mm -hmm. So what is it, was it an easy transition or was it more difficult for you to start doing abstract art and kind of find your style? It was pretty easy for me because I, I think my figuration is, was terrible. And I think that <laughs> there was, uh, <laughs> there's so many artists, uh, a lot of the inspiration that I take even currently come from figurative artists. There's, you know, brilliant artists out there of uh, all backgrounds, but um, 
it wasn't really a struggle. I started diving into it, and uh, yeah, I, I think that I found something that works for me, um, and we'll see where it takes me in the future, but it wasn't, it wasn't hard to transition. <laughs> Great. Uh, how, are we, how are we on time? Perfect. One more? Okay, we, we got, we got um, one more. There you go. On, on this side of the room, we have another question. Um, I'd like to know what you're excited to work on next. Like, what's your next big project? Ooh. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I want to continue um, along the lines of now breaking down aspects of um, post-traumatism. So I have a show that I'm um, currently in talks with the gallery about that I, I'd like to pursue. Um, and one of those areas deals with, uh, like, uh, the economics in a way, so the title of the show, I'm not gonna give away too much, but the title of the show is gonna be Financial Times, but um, it has a sculptural element that I'm, I mean, I'm really excited about, um, and the paintings themselves are gonna be sort of titled after, you know, these economic terms, t uh, terms that I sought out as a, um, as a youth in order to sort of find an element of freedom, uh, which is a whole different side of me, but, uh, that's that's what I'm excited about working on next, but it's always exciting just to get into the studio and and paint. Um, one other thing that I'm working on is uh, a new series, a foundation series. If you've seen any of my older work, I was talking about this earlier, but they had these color blocks that were in them that were inspired um, by a few different things, but um, I'm creating these foundation series that are sort of inspired by um, the influence of concrete and um, my practice as well. And the sort of brutalist structures that I found growing up in the Bronx and tying that into this concept of, um, you know, brutalist ideologies of, of utopia and, and how that sort of crumbled in on itself and became like the projects. So, uh, yep. So, so, so not, not much to work on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, that's great. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Um, so I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, it, this has really been um, fun and rewarding for me. And, um, you know, I hadn't seen Patrick in person in, uh, in four years. Four years, yep. You know, which is kind of crazy, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. uh, four years till yesterday. Yep. <laughs> we worked on this show completely remote. Um, and so that's another reason why I'm just really excited um, to, to be here. And uh, with that, I want to just remind everyone that, you know, the Gantt Center is a wonderful cultural institution that can use support from viewers like you. And if you want to support the Gantt Center, you can do so at gantcenter.org forward slash donate. Um, you don't need to remember that. You, you know, you just go to the website and I'm sure you can find that button. Um, I also want to share that on December 12th, we'll have our next um, open air talk. This one will be virtual again is with artist uh, Dammit Wesley. That'll be December 12th at 7 p.m. That will also be on the Gantz website, and you can follow the Gantz on social media if you don't already. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I just encourage everyone to take some more time to go back and see Patrick's show and talk to one another. We'll be here for the remainder of the evening, and thank you all, and uh, good night. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>